nervous system as compared to those of the peripheral nervous system? That's true, one's the boss, one's the worker. I'm looking, I have a key word that gets you points on the test. Very good. The peripheral has connective tissue, the central does not. What does that mean about the central nervous system? Very delicate. Thus, what do we do? Protect it with a skull and a vertebral column. What two types of cells create the nervous system? Neurons and neuroglial cells, or neuroglia. How does myelination affect the action potentials of a nerve? First of all, what's an action potential? That's just a word for the signal that shoots along a nerve. And you'll learn a boatload about action potentials if you take a human physiology. So action potential is that electrical signal. And how does myelination affect it? It makes it faster because it creates those nodes. And what's it called when the action potential jumps from node to node? Saltatory conduction. Very good. And you all had the clapping analogy metaphor to show how that works. Um, what are the similarities and differences between Schwann cells, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes? So first of all, what type of nervous tissue are these? Are they neurons or neuroglial cells? They're neuroglial cells, right? The neurons are the pseudo-unipolar, the multipolar, and the bipolar. All the polar ones are the neurons. These are the neuroglial cells. And what do they all, they, okay. So which ones are in the central nervous system? Which ones are in the peripheral nervous system? Very good. Oligodendrocytes and astrocytes are in the central nervous system. The Schwann cells are in the peripheral nervous system. Which ones myelinate, which one doesn't? Schwann cells, do they myelinate or not? They myelinate. They have the ability to myelinate. Sometimes, remember, there's that weird one, they just kind of put a little bit of myelin on it, and we call it a neurolemma. But if they wrap it a bunch of times, that's called myelinating. So Schwann cells can do that. Um, can oligodendrocytes do that? In the CNS, yes. Schwann cells myelinate one neuron. Oligodendrocytes, do they myelinate only one neuron? No, they stick out, oligo means many. So they stick out many arms and myelinate many nerves. And then the astrocytes, they have that funny picture where they're just kind of plating the neurons with a little bit of myelin. Which one then would be associated with gray matter of the brain, and which one would be white matter of the brain? So who's going to be gray matter? Astrocytes, because they don't myelinate, they only plate. And thus the white matter, you would think oligodendrocytes. Questions with those neuroglial cells? Okay. Yes, generally when you think white matter, you're just talking about a central nervous system. But yeah, I mean, for instance, I guess you'd call it gray matter in that gray communicating ramus, but most of the peripheral nervous system is white matter, which is why those big nerve neurons and nerves have to go through the white communicating ramus. Um, okay, what types of cells are transducers? What is a transducer? one form of energy to another form of energy, and what cells act as them? I heard it. Sensory receptors. And why is that important? Exactly. We want to convert the energy that we're sensing into electrical energy because that's the energy that the nervous system understands. So for instance, your mouse is kind of like a mechanoreceptor. When you click it, it takes mechanical energy and it turns it into an electrical impulse that your computer understands. Very
very similarly in your fingertips, there are many mechanoreceptors that if you press on them with enough energy, they cause a gate to open in a neuron and you shoot an impulse towards the central nervous system. That's what those are. Number seven. A, a sensory receptor cell. So you have mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, pain receptors are called nociceptors, chemoreceptors for taste, etc. For pressure, like uh, blood pressure, they're called baroreceptors, like a barometer, etc., etc. Plenty of different types. When an action potential arrives at the axon terminal, the blanks fuse with the cell membrane. So what are these blanks? They're a ball full of chemicals. What do we call them? Synaptic vesicles. So when that message gets to the end of the axon, the synaptic vesicles fuse with the cell membrane and release what into the synaptic cleft? Neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters cross the synaptic cleft, bind to a membrane receptor, and thus the electrical impulse is passed along. Opens the gate and it keeps going. So again, synaptic vesicles release neurotransmitters. We already talked about this, the difference between a nerve and a neuron. Neurons are just the cells themselves. Neurons are, or nerves, are neurons with neuroglial cells wrapped in connective tissue. Um, do we want to spend time on nine? That's just that one where it's very much like a muscle. You draw the endoneurium, the perineurium, and the siculus. We're going to skip that one. It's in your book. The peripheral nervous system carries blank or motor impulses from the blank to the blank. So motor, what's another word for motor? Efferent or afferent? Efferent. efferent. Sensory would be afferent or afferent, however you want to pronounce it. Because afferent or afferent is arriving to your central nervous system, thus it's sensory. Efferent is exiting, thus it's motor. So that cancels out C and D as possible options. And is motor going to carry things from the muscles to the central nervous system or the central nervous system to the muscles? Motor's coming out of the spinal cord, so from the central nervous system out to the muscles to tell them to contract. Questions there? Okay. We're going to do, we have time for a trace or two. <coughs> practice some. You can either sketch this really quick or just watch. Again, in your workbook, there's plenty of these, and I went and found a photocopier and printed a bunch more to practice, and you'll get used to doing nervous traces. What parts of a normal spinal level have I negated to draw? So I have a dorsal root, dorsal root, ganglion, ventral root, dorsal ramus, ventral ramus. What's some key things that are missing? What would be about here? communicating ramus, or T1 to L2, what else would be there? A white communicating ramus. And if this were like S2 to S4, what would be on the ventral ramus? A parasympathetic flanking nerve. Okay, so we're going to start with number two. So a sensory stimulus from the right upper limb initiates a motor stimulus in the right upper musculature of the left upper limb musculature. Pardon me. And the left upper limb musculature. So to simplify, something in my right arm causes, that I sense, causes muscle movement in my right and my left arm. So this is how a test question will be worded. And I'll show you. Now we'll talk about how we do it. So where are we going to start? With a sensory neuron or a motor neuron? Sensory. sensory. If I'm in the limb, is it going to come through the ventral ramus or the dorsal ramus? The 
ventral. The dorsal ramus only goes to that stuff along your spine, that muscular that you do when you do a deadlift at the gym or you get in that funky machine that like holds your hands and you go up and down. That's your epicacular back muscle. So it's gonna come, so it's gonna start, we're gonna have our sensory neuron, and it's gonna start out here. And since it's sensory, we're gonna go into the dorsal ramus or the ventral ramus? The dorsal ramus. And what am I gonna show in the dorsal ramus? cell body, which I'm going to be squiggly, cell body, and then it's going to come, and the first thing it's going to do is it's going to synapse with a motor neuron that's going to go right back out to the musculature of my right upper limb, up here. So is my motor neuron going to come out the ventral rootless and ventral ramus or the dorsal rootless and dorsal ramus? Ventral. So I'm going to show my motor neuron come out, and if I get to the spinal nerve trunk, am I going to head the dorsal ramus or the ventral ramus? Ventral ramus. And then to show it acting on the muscle, all you do is have that fork. So again, this one is a very simple one where it's stimulus in causes motor out. And when there's, and really, I haven't used my central nervous system. I used a peripheral sensory nerve and a peripheral motor nerve. And that's interesting because, I'll get to your question, whenever you do those things where they hit your knee and it moves, the knee jerk reflex, that's exactly this type of a reflex. It never goes up to the spinal cord or up to the brain. So if I lacerated your spinal cord like T6, that would still work. sensory neurons are blue, my motor neurons are red. Okay, so we've gotten one part of the, the, the question. We've motor, sent out our, a, our efferent motor impulse to the musculature of the right upper limb. We also need to go to the left upper limb. And this brings us to the importance of interneurons, which wasn't necessarily stressed in lecture. You have to use an interneuron whenever you cross to the other side of the spinal cord or whenever you go up and down the spinal cord levels. So again, interneurons are used to cross the spinal cord or to go up and down. So in this case, my sensory neuron comes in from my right side and I need to tell my left side to do something. So can my sensory neuron just send um, a message to this side by itself? No, what's gonna happen is it's going to act on an interneuron also a multipolar neuron, and he's just going to cross the spinal cord and then tell a motor neuron on the left side to go. Does that make sense? So I just had to use this cute little interneuron to cross from right side to left. If for some reason also I need to send a message down here, I would also touch an interneuron and it would go all the way down. Does that make sense? What questions do you have? Okay, so this guy's gonna come over, touch a motor neuron that's efferent. Is the efferent motor neuron gonna go to the ventral or dorsal root? Ventral. ventral root. And if I'm going to the limb muscle, am I gonna take the ventral ramus or the dorsal? Ventral. Ventral ramus because the limbs are part of the body wall. No, uh, most ganglionic. So this, Motor. we're talking about skeletal muscle. When do we have a pre-ganglionic and post-ganglionic? Smooth, Smooth muscle. So for those that have lecture right after this, you're gonna learn this again and again. It's always one motor neuron to skeletal muscle. If you're going to smooth muscle, how many motor neurons do we have? Two. 